Sinä kautta ka tuo kohe voi voi mai mei kai raro te maru o aura ki o mai tsua hiri kia kaita te opi nei muna hau e fa ka nei tsu mi aroha kia kaita what i would like to talk about is how we unleash the greatest creative project of 300,000 people heading in one direction but before i go there what I'd like everyone to do, because we're going to get some audience participation, is to stand up. Oh, this is successful. And hug both your neighbours. <laughs> that comes out of that, I like the credit. But, sitting down, the, the reason I wanted us to start here is that as many of you will remember, in the days and weeks that followed the earthquake, that was what our community felt like. That in an unparalleled way, amidst devastation, the greatest qualities of our humanity came out. And in this greatest, greatest creative project that we have now, it's that humanity, it's that human spirit that humbled us in extraordinary ways that I think is going to bring us the Christchurch we want and deserve. And what I want to talk about is communication, because everyone who's got a partner or parents or children knows that communication is an art form that we regularly suck at. <laughs> so, <laughs> So how do we manage to have a conversation amongst 300,000 people without it going horribly wrong? And obviously we're in a state of change, so I'm, I'm not claiming to be the instrument of change, but I would like to be helpful. How do we bring ourselves together to talk to each other? And the context for this project of change, which is fundamentally ours, we are our own creators, is We've got a context where we as individuals or we as organisations are talking to the powers that be. So 10,000 people had a linear conversation with the Christchurch City Council last weekend. And some of us have had the opportunity to look at what our fellow city members have said. And we've had the opportunity to be inspired and the like. But it's really been a linear conversation. How, how many of us have had the opportunity to bring our organisations together with our whole opposites and start to bridge our differences? And the simple answer is I don't think we have, but I think we absolutely must do that. And the reason for it is we've got two organisations with an intimidating, is the only word I can think of, job before them. They have to make decisions that will affect us, that will affect our children, that will affect our grandchildren. And at this time, the way they have to make decisions is on the basis of that linear conversation. What I want is I want us to make our own decisions together. And to do that, we have to talk to each other and not cede our decisional autonomy to authority institutions. Now just a note, our benevolent big brother Sarah, I, I think is a very important institution that is populated by very talented and good people. So it's not a lack of trust, this is fundamentally about our community and how we want it to be now and into the future. We've spent a lot of time talking today about the legacy of our built form and that will be extraordinarily important. But even more important, in my opinion, is the legacy we build for our community. And I want to share some of the things that exist within Te Ao Māori about social processes and community creation and rebuilding to contribute to that. So the, the first thing is a vision. And the story to this is Naitahu over seven generations had a singular purpose. That was the claim. Over seven generations, there was a story that was carried. It was an oral history that lived, that had a pulse, 
that was an utterly catalyzing and galvanizing force for a people. And that resulted in both the most profound change for our people over a colonial history that we know. And the thing that I understand that got us through was the singular version. Many of you will have seen Te Reiranga or Naitahu's byline of Mo Tata a Mo Kauri a Muriaki Nei for us and our children after us. And it looks like quite a nifty thing, right? But it comes from the late 1800s. We've had the same mantra for over a hundred years. That vision of creating an intergenerational future. And that same spirit, that ability to endure over a very hard and taxing time, which, if we're being honest, we're all about to go into. We know, but we don't really want to know that tomorrow it's not going to be okay, that this is a decade or more of a collective journey to get to a new city with a vibrant community. So in that, what was it that carried the Naitahu story? It was that vision of creating a limitless future. And it was shared. And there were also a number of things that we did as a people that kept us together, that perpetuated our identity. And for us now, I think that is our challenge. It's to ask those questions of ourselves, of each other, to talk to each other about the details. Because we've got a common trajectory. We want a sustainable city. We want a vibrant community. We want these things. But there are details under that that we've got to talk through and that we disagree on. So how do you have that conversation? Well, first, we're not going to um, go very far. If we think that the recovery strategy and that the recovery plan for the CBD are the answers for that. Because in my opinion, they're not. They're incredibly important. They'll make real contributions. But the language in them is very clear. The recovery strategy is for us to recover. The recovery plan for the CBD is for how we can recover the CBD. I don't believe that there is a single person in here today that is just looking for recovery. I believe that you're here looking for transformational change. And if we are looking for transformational change, we are the agents and the creators of that, and we need to have the vision for that transformation beyond bear recovery. So, <clears throat> if we're going to get grand, and to steal a line from my hero that we saw earlier, Majora Carter, you shouldn't have to leave your community to live in a better one. But how do we work out what that better one is together? Well, yeah, the moral of the story, I think, is democracy, some assembly required. And some patience and empathy along the way. Um, participatory democracy, nice, nice word, nice political discourse sitting behind it. But the story that I think is useful here is how hui happen within Sao Māori. And there's the little glib lines that there's too many hui, not enough doi, but you know, we'll leave that to one side. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things I find fascinating is we've got these wonderful stately gentlemen that are seen out in the world, quite often with sunglasses on so they look quite scary. And you don't get to see that behind it. Within Iwi, there is a dynamic and passionate democracy that's occurring. There is live participatory democracy happening within our communities. It's not always gentle, in fact it can be quite rugged. But, um, <clears throat> yes, those ones that laughed, they know. <laughs> I, I think that for us, we need to learn from the process of we, and to learn from some of the understandings in participatory democracy so that we can start having the conversation amongst <coughs> ourselves. So that we can bring our faith-based organisations, our sports groups, um, <clears throat> every organisation that exists within our community is an institution. It has members, it has life, it has pulse, it has identity. And to bring those identities together, to have a conversation together about what a transformational change and future we want to create together. Because again, and I can't say this enough, 
If we as a community do not forge a consensus amongst ourselves, there is no choice but for the authorities to make a decision on our behalf. So how many of you want to have a decision made on your behalf? This is where you get to participate and raise your hands again. <laughs> so, so there's a couple, and, and we also know from, from our histories that sometimes decision making is a little terrifying, and sometimes we would kind of like to, to cede our decision making authority to others. But really, we don't. If we can build the courage together, if we can talk to a common story, then we can create a transformational future for ourselves. And <clears throat> I think there are two parts to this. The first is the vision. Coming together, forging a consensus on the vision. But the second is about the implementation challenge. And we've already heard about the challenges of implementation today and how incredibly important they are. And <clears throat> so the, the moral of the story for this slide, and just in case you can't read the quote by that funky little dude sitting down, one original thought is worth a thousand mindless quotings. <laughs> so <clears throat> I think that collaboration is the new black and it's never gonna go out of fashion, and we need to become highly skilled at collaborative processes and collaborative projects as soon as we can. Within our landscape, we all know that central and local government have enormous contributions to make in the implementation. In my almost mathematically dyslexic way, I'd estimate that they're responsible for a fifth of this challenge that a fifth of what we're talking about is the recovery. The rest of it, the four fifths that's remaining, is our job. And it's our job whether we're talking in terms of being part of an organisation or an institution, being a business owner, being an employee, being a family member, whatever it is, that four fifths of this job of strength transformation is ours. So, how do we manage to do good collaborative teamwork together, and I'm not sure how many of you have fond memories of high school based teamwork projects, <laughs> but I expect there's few. And <clears throat> so the thing that I think we can learn from is an enormous body of global precedent. So collaboration is the new black across the world, and we're progressively seeing this growth in new catchphrase, multi-stakeholder partnerships. That are doing everything from delivering nets across the world, uh, in Africa, to inhibit the transfer of malaria, right through to seeing mobile banking and the like. The thing I think that roots them in something successful, and this is also stealing an idea from our construction friend, is to have a charter that sits underneath it. The multi-stakeholder partnerships that are working in Africa are succeeding because they're directed to the Millennium Development Goals, because they've got a very clear purpose, because they've got a very clear time frame, milestones, commonality again, these projects are working. And I think that if we can look as Christchurch to forge a consensus on first a vision, and ask really good questions that go into that vision. Do we want our children and our grandchildren to learn through intergenerational learning hubs? How do we want our children and our grandchildren to play, to know each other, to experience their spirituality, to experience their naughtiness? If, if we can ask those questions and form a vision, and if we can move from that bit to an implementation plan <coughs> which isn't too mechanistic to lose the soul and the purpose, then perhaps we can move into the next challenge, which is understanding everyone's roles and responsibilities. And I, I hear that for multi-stakeholder partnerships, or any partnership, it's the roles and the responsibilities and the accountabilities that matter. So while we're doing that, we could potentially confess to ourselves that local and central government are no longer the sole organisations in our political landscape that administer our human rights. 
that arguably the enormous significant contributions of business also impact on our human rights as citizens. And that equally our, our public and our private life, it all impacts on our rights, on the society and the community that we're creating for ourselves and for our children and grandchildren after us. So <clears throat> I think the next step in the conversation from there is if we admit that we're collectively government, business, community, responsible for the human rights of our fellow citizens, then I think it creates a requirement for table stakes. That if you're going to contribute to the rebuilding of Christchurch, there are table stakes to get in the game. And that table stake has got to be, in the first instance, a pledge to give effect to a common charter that's based on forged consensus. And we've already had the incredibly moving experience of the pledge in Christchurch. And I think we should be building on that and taking it to the next level, committing to the people of Christchurch toward a common purpose for our shared creative project. So essentially what I'm advocating is a grand public-private partnership. And we're very familiar with hearing about these PPPs for infrastructure investment and development. And that's not really how I mean it. Because infrastructure is great. I'd quite like some back in the east side, actually. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately, a public-private partnership should be designed to create the community legacy that we want for our future generations. For Nainthahu, the, the legacy for our people is our people. There is a saying that is used extensively throughout Tsao Māori, Ka te mea nui o te ao, he tangata, he tangata, he tangata. What is the most important thing in the world? It is people, it is people, it is people. And that is the legacy that we're building today. And if we're going to learn from indigenous knowledge, other than just the cheeky bits, like Taitipani's story about the settlers obviously wanting to get wet and feel in their safe zone in the swamp. It's that how we talk to each other matters. Being a process junkie is okay. Because that process is what will forge a consensus. If we don't have a consensus or some potential to move towards it, then the decisions that are made will not be our own. We will not have created our own destiny. The sole purpose for an iwi existing at this time is to create our own destiny in our own image for our own descendants. And that, I believe, is a reality that is shared by the entirety of Christchurch. Our a collective, creative pursuit is to create our own shared future. Nā reira, tēnā koutou.